Hey ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining me again today. We've got a lot of exciting news from Nikon to deal with today, uh, with some new uh, rumours and prospective cameras coming out, new lenses potentially as well. And so of course I've got a lot to have opinion on this and I'd like to discuss it. So the Nikon rumours at the moment are promoting that the Z6 Mark III will be coming out very shortly. And there's a lot of rumoured specs on it. Now I know they're having a sort of a get together, a lot of the Nikon reps on an island north of Africa shortly, just south of Spain, and I think there might be some release prospects then. So that could be pretty exciting to see what they come up with. Uh, but at the moment, the specs of the Z6, well, it should be released, I believe, in about April. And that will be very uh, handy because a lot of people have been waiting for a X-Speed 7 processor and a Z6 because we never got those processor upgrades we were hoping for with the Mark II models, did we? And that's, of course, why I sold my Z6 Mark II and Z7 Mark II and upgraded to the Z9 so I could get access to that processor and the better autofocus that it provides and other options. So uh, I'm looking forward to that, lens, that camera coming out and I'm sure I'll obtain one when it does so. Uh, but at the mo moment, the uh, rumours of the specs of this camera is that it will still have a 24 megapixel uh, pro uh, sen uh, sensor, sorry, and that 24 megapixel sensor will be an upgraded version from the previous models. So it will be a new sensor, I believe, and, and that should be very handy and useful. The uh, other aspect of it is that it will have the XP7 processor, and of course that will make it have many, many options as the 8 and the Z9 have. So, you know, it will sort of keep it up in par now with the ZF, that was an interesting camera come out with the x 7 processor and people have been raving about the options and the capabilities of that camera. So the Z6 of course will be a better hybrid than that. It'll of course have the uh, CF Express card available, if not a SD card as well, and uh, that'll be a real performance package. So you'll get higher video specs, you'll get certainly uh, faster frame rates, and I, I would imagine a much better versatile unit as a collective. So I'm very excited to have that. They believe the ergonomics will be better, maybe a slightly bigger body, maybe by 10 or 15%, and that'll help with the cooling as well, which I think is great. There were, of course, some issues with the little pinky finger hanging off the grip because it wasn't a very deep camera in length. So I think they may have increased the overall volume to accommodate that and make it a little bit more comfortable in the hands. So it'll still be smaller than a Z8, but it'll be uh, much, much more comfortable than the former models. So I think all these are positive refinements and I'm excited to see them happen. Now exactly all the confirmed details we don't really know. We are speculating and guessing exactly what they'll do with it. But I know this that they were probably a little bit embarrassed about where the Z6 and Z7 Mark IIs ended up and the uh, complaints about it. And they're sure going to absolutely eliminate any of these whingy little issues. So there'll be a battery group come out with it, no doubt at all, fully functional in time, and uh, there'll be many other options. And of course, it'll get the same progress of firmware upgrades as the Z8 and the Z9 have had, and of course, it'll only get better and better. So no matter how great it is when it's released, give it 12 months of firmware upgrades and it'll be unbelievable. So I'm fully confident in believing you'll get 4K uh, 30, 60, and even at 120 frames per second. Will there be 8K? Absolutely not. There's no 8K possible. Even if they upgraded the sensors megapixels from the 24 to say 30 or thereabouts, it still won't be enough for 8K. 8K you need minimum 36 megapixels. They ain't gonna put a 36 megapixel uh, sensor in a Z6 because then that's gonna eat into the Z8, the Z9, and make uh, the Z7 nearly impossible to make competitive and interesting. So on that line, while we're talking about that, the Z7 will probably come out at the end of 2024, and I'd imagine that one there would have something like a 65 megapixel uh, sensor, because it's got to be relevant. It's got to be higher than the Z8 and Z9, or you just buy a Z8 and Z9. Uh, it'll have to be uh, much more interesting than the Z6, or else you just get the Z6. So I'm reckoning that rather than just another 45 megapixel sensor, which would make it compete and be a bit irritating towards the Z8 and Z9, they're going to overshoot that and make it all about resolution and not about speed and performance. So its speed and performance may or may not decrease a bit. I mean, having that new process is gonna certainly help and uh, help it keep up. But just the sheer magnitude of the files and all those pixels are gonna to have to slow it up a bit. And therefore, that'll still give the Z8 and the Z9 a niche in the market where they're just that little bit faster and quicker. 
So that's where I see these two cameras uh, filling in in 2024. And the Z6 particularly is the one that excites me. I don't need 65 megapixels. Be honest with you, that's just ridiculous to me. I got more than enough megapixels as I want with the Z9. And then there's also there's the issue of then uh, lowering the ISO quality because the more pixels you have, then the worse the low light ends up becoming. So it just becomes very difficult for me with birding and so on if I've got megapixels that are so high, if the lighting outside isn't magnificent and perfect every time, that becomes a real nuisance. So for me personally, I'm finding that uh, the 45 is more than enough anyway. And I've found actually the 24, even, even the Z6 uh, Mark I and Z6 Mark II, were actually very excellent files. When you compare them side by side on the computer, you zoom in 200% or whatever, uh, you don't see double the pixel quality. What you see is maybe about 50% more because it's just diminishing points of return. I suppose I've used that saying quite a few times, but just because something is so much bigger doesn't mean you're getting every bit of result of that because it comes into the factor of lighting and it comes into the ISOs and it comes into many different factors and just simply the uh, smaller the megapixels are in a sensor, the cleaner they are. <clears throat> a perfect example of that would be the Sony cameras when you have the uh, Sony, um, well they call them the uh, 7S models, A7S. And I've used the A7S uh, Mark II and it was a 12 megapixel camera. And I had that mostly for video. Uh, when the video capability of the mirrorless cameras in Nikon uh, exceeded my expectations, then I was able to switch over to them. But I did use that Sony for some time. And even with pictures, and I can show you a picture sample or two, even at 12 megapixels, in low light situations at night, that thing was amazing. It was fabulous. You needed very little lighting. Just some sort of a modest, dim uh, LED panel, and that was more than enough to brighten up the image and get a great result. So I was very impressed with that. So low megapixels have their advantage. It's not all doom and gloom and bad. It's not like you're missing out. The actual image quality can be awesomely great and more than adequate for 90% of your work. Now, if you're doing things like product photography, you're taking photos of diamond rings and watches for a jewelry catalog, yeah, you may want every bit of megapixel you can get. But when you're just taking photos of like portraits, for example, and weddings, you don't need file sizes that are massive and huge. You're taking a thousand or two thousand or three thousand photos in a day for a wedding, you don't want these massive files. They can actually be a damn nuisance to work with. So all everything has its plan and purpose and uh, position. And I think the Z6 III is going to be an excellent combination a multi-use camera that'll please everybody. And with that new processor, no more gripes about autofocus and sucking about uh, missing out on options. You'll have a fully equipped, very powerful camera that'll do almost everything. I'm very excited about it. I'm really looking forward to getting one. I think it'll be the answer to many prayers, to be honest with you. And it'll probably end up taking over from the camera that we're using right now. So I like this little Z6 because of its compact size and form factor. I like it when you use it with the little lenses like this recently purchased 50 1.8. You have that and that uh, Z6 in your camera bag. It's a very light little package and that's very comfortable to use and take around with you on the right occasion. So I'm all for it. Two thumbs up for Nikon for having that in the uh, pipeline. Uh, exactly how, when and who it's coming out, well, we'll just have to wait and see and be patient. But uh, that is something I'm looking forward to. So uh, other subjects I would like to discuss today other than that Nikon news is I want to talk to you a little bit about these. And you're going to sort of say, Mark, what are you doing? You're talking about little pieces of crap again. This is boring and we don't really want to know. Well, let me tell you, you want to know about this because this is actually really uh, important. I do a lot of bird photography, as you know. And when I do bird photography, I will mount these. Uh, I have obviously a Arco Swiss plate I've added onto the uh, lens body here. And of course I can use that on my mounts on my monopod or tripod. Very handy for video, but the monopod's great just for photos when you really need it steady. Birds in flight, for example, where you're holding the lens up for a very long period of time, monopod can be amazing. But that's all very well, and you've got the mount, but how do you hold the monopod? Where do you put that and carry it? I mean, that's really annoying to have it over your shoulder on another sling. So what we've got is an option here that I think is very excellent. I'm just gonna add my little cotton carrier mount to this camera now. Only takes a few seconds, if I can get this right. I'll put it down because you know what, I've tried to do this in the past and I make a complete mess of it when I'm trying to hold it. So let me just get some uh, grip on that and stability. And I'll see if I can find the uh, threaded hole there to put that in. Seems to be coming down. The important thing about when you're putting the cotton carrier mounts on, and they're very simple, it's just an Allen key screw, but you've got to make sure 
put them on nice and tight, and make sure the little arrow they give you, the arrow is always pointing towards the end of the lens. That arrow is there as a guide to show you which way it should be pointing, so that when you place it on and off, it actually comes on and off very quick and easily. We'll get back to that in just a moment, but I just wanted to make sure that that rig was uh, fully equipped when I do a demonstration later. Now, what I've got here is some illustrations of various Arco Swiss mounts and their applications. These are very excellent when you're just joining bits of equipment together. So you're putting a uh, little uh, flash unit on top of a, uh, a monopod or on top of a tripod. They're very quick and easy to put on and clamp on. So that's a very conventional 50 mil one and uh, certainly very strong and capable. This is a variation on this one and I find this one particularly fascinating. So I'll just take the little uh, clamp off the adjustment and you'll get a better look at it and see what we've got going on there. But it's circular this one where most of them are usually rectangular or square. This one here is circular. And why is it circular? Because you've got a little button here you can release and it becomes now something that moves and twists into position. So I'll uh, illustrate that here with this one here. I've got this on what would be a pretend tripod and uh, what you do is you unrelease it and now rather than have to move the whole tripod around what you can do is you can tighten that up Make sure it's fixed in and then now you can just adjust whatever you've got on there very quickly. What am I talking about? Well here, let me illustrate. I'm just going to put this little light on and we're going to pretend that this is on top of a uh, tripod. So I'll just turn it on so you can see that uh, things are happening here. There we go, we've got it on for just for illustration purposes, I'll try and make that as pale as I can as I can. And uh, so now let's say that's on a fixed tripod and I'm lighting some subject, but it's not quite right in position. I just want to make a minor adjustment. Well, if I don't have a ball head on top, let's say I don't have one. All I have is this sort of an arrangement here where I can go up and down, but I can't really go left and right with it. Well, then what I can do here is just gently and very simply rotate it to the position I want and that saves me having to have a ball head or any other device like that. So it's just it's a very quick, quick and simple change, particularly useful when these things are on extension poles and they're very high. You can't reach up there to make the adjustment. So this is down low at the tripod base level, and of course you can make your little minor adjustments very comfortably without stretching and overly reaching. So that's what those little rotation ones are for, and I think they're magnificent. I have like about six of those on all my tripods, and they're very, very handy. The other thing I wanted to talk to you about was these plates here, which you can buy them. There's obviously a much longer rectangular version. This is about 100 mil. And the idea of this one here is you've got multiple points of uh, mounting and you can actually add accessories to them as well, which is interesting. And so they've got a great big strong grip so that when you put it on a big heavy device such as this and you use that for mounting, it's a very good grip and it doesn't slip or move. It stays there very securely. You can be confident that uh, there's not going to go anywhere. The other advantage of something very long like that, of course, is that when it's in there, you've got some play. See the play you've got there? So you can balance your camera. That seesaw effect, oh, it needs to go further forward, it needs to come further back. You've got some latitude with that. You don't get that luxury if you're mounting it with a little 50 mil one. So buying the right size one, I think, is absolutely critical and very important. And these, uh, this will they come in various sizes in this model. They'll come in a 50 mil, a 75, a 90, and like this, I think it's 110 mil. So they've got great options, and I encourage you to go ahead and buy several of them. I've used them on multiple occasions. And for objects like a large lens-mounted camera, where you need to have some sway in balance, that's a fantastic item to have with the accessory also of the longer plate as well. You've got all that slide ability to get the balance and perfect adjustment you want and make it very comfortable in the hands when you're using it. Now what's the point of these other little holes though? How are they ever going to come in handy to you? Well that's something I'd like to illustrate for you. So I'll just, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to stand up, I'm going to put on my cotton carrier of vest, I'm going to mount the uh, camera and lens to my chest and I'm going to show you how I take my monopod around and it makes it very comfortable and easy. So just bear with me while I put that together. So hi guys, here we are. I've got the cotton carrier vest on now, as you can see in the room. And I've, I've got a wider shot so you can see what's going on. Now the idea of the cotton carrier is to be able to support equipment, and particularly a camera which sits right on your torso in the centre line of your body and helps you support all the weight comfortably, particularly when it's heavy equipment and you may be doing a lot of hiking. The other accessory, however, that this has that's very interesting is on the side here you'll see a second mount. So you've got your main mount here on the middle, then you've got a second little patch little uh, bracket here and with the 
cotton carry a mount. Now what's this one here for? Well this is usually for a second camera. So let's say you get your main camera here, you might want a little 24 to 70 or something on a Z6 on your side, so you've got some wides with you just in case as well. That's really what it's for, but we can use it for a very interesting uh, apparatus and I'll show you all about it. I was talking about various clips and I was showing you uh, these Arco Swiss mounts and how useful they are. And I'm saying how we can mount accessories to them. Now here I've mounted the cotton carrier system to it. So I just bring that up to the camera here and we can see it there. Little mount there I've put on it. Now what's the point of that? Well you see these are very awkward to carry with you. If you've got your camera with you, and I'll just put the camera on so I can illustrate, and it wouldn't matter if you had it on a camera strap and you had it to the side, or you've got it on your cotton carrier. Either way, it's going to be strapped to your body in some way. And if it's on a strap alone and not on this uh, system here, vest, it tends to swing around if you've got it just on a camera strap. And as you're walking around, it's very annoying. And if you've got anything else on a camera strap, like a second camera or a tripod or something you're carrying with you as well, they're both swinging around and clanging like mad, and it's very discomfortable. You know, you're not enjoying your day out at all. And you also can be hurting people, flicking things around and knocking it everywhere. And you don't want to knock your gear. So what's the solution then? If I want to take this with me, what am I going to do? I'm going to put this onto a, uh, a camera strap and I'll just illustrate here. I'll whack it on very quickly if I can. There we go. Now if I want to carry that with me conventionally, what do I have to do? Put it over here like this. Okay, and that's how I'm with me. But as I'm walking, look what's happening with the uh, monopod as I'm moving around. You see it swinging around? Like that's a weapon. That thing's flopping everywhere and it's very irritating. So I don't actually encourage monopods on straps, nor do I really encourage cameras on straps, unless that's the only thing you're taking. If you're taking any extra gear with you, the last thing you need is two straps. So what's the solution? Well, I've got this little uh, equipment here, the cotton carrier mount on, and now I'm gonna show you just how great that is to work with. So again, I'll show you the side on profile, and you can see the cotton carrier arrangement. Now this goes on always at this angle such as this, right? So it's on a horizontal angle. You slide it into the little bracket, and you just let it drop basically, and once it goes down, that's locked in. Now this won't come out. It's not that it just will fall out. No, you can't get it out unless you take it back to that angle, and then you lift it out. And it comes out very quick and easy. In fact, you can get quite quick at this. It could almost be like one of those old Western, you know, quick draw arrangements where you try and zip it out as quick as you can. But that's just a joke, obviously. But the thing is, the accessibility is really good. You have to have it sideways, which of course, what does that mean if you have to have it sideways? You know you're taking it out. And when you drop it down, it's very secured. So here, when I fling around now, because it's in a secure slot, and in an actual mount, it's not flinging around now. See how it doesn't fling around? It actually sits, I think of it very much like the sword in the old days, but you know, 1800s and they used to have a, a long sword on their side uh, for battle. Well, it's sort of like that. It's sitting very comfortably along your leg and you can put up with that all day because it's in a proper holster if you wish. So I'm encouraging people, if you're gonna have a monopod, and I'll just come back a bit so you can see it there in full length. Very comfortable, it sits right up against the body. In fact, you can actually use this as an armrest if you like. <laughs> I'm not sure that's really what its intentional purpose was, but uh, that's something else that's going on there. But uh, yeah, I like the way that uh, it's easy and quick to dismantle when you need it to come off. You can use it very quickly, and when you're done with it for the uh, moment, and you want to travel some more, you just slot it in, drop it, and forget about it, and it's never going to come off you and, and annoy anybody, and certainly it doesn't annoy yourself as you're walking around. So just another profile pic of that and how it sits on your leg. I think it's very comfortable. I like using it and uh, I highly recommend using this cotton carrier system and particularly using the right sort of a bracket here. So a nice long Arco Swiss mount gives you the opportunity to actually mount something because you've got extra screw holes and secondly, you know, they give you three if not four of these cotton carrier little mounting uh, brackets with you when you buy the kit. So when you buy the cotton carrier kit, you don't just get one of these, you get three or four. I think it's actually four, to be honest with you, two grey ones and two black ones. The grey ones have a slight angle on them in case you need a tilt or an angle on your gear. But I think this is a great system for taking your monopod around. And I just want to encourage people to uh, deal with their equipment safely and comfortable. Because if you're not comfortable, you're not enjoying your day. You know, if you're flinging things around and clanging them against trees, you're worried you're gonna break stuff and, and maybe irritate people as well if you're close by someone. So uh, thank you for your time on that. I did want to demonstrate that in all detail. So I've got a nice wide angle here and I hope uh, it's light enough for you to see what's going on. I know of course what I've got here is a dark shirt and a black vest, so it's not very easy to see. But uh, this is actually exactly the sort of coloration I would use if I'm going out. I don't use bright colors or whites. I'm always using dark colors 
colours of some sort, whether they be khaki, greens, browns or dark blues. So let me just illustrate one more thing while you have it on, just to make it all worthwhile. When they're by the cotton carry system, it comes with two of these straps. They're safety straps, as a second backup, and you can actually add them to your uh, camera body here. And as you just clip them on, your little mounts on the side, little brackets, it gives you a second era of safety. So if you were to drop the camera, the straps are going to hold it up, and they're very strong and capable. Don't be frightened to think that they're not going to support the weight. They're very strong brackets, very strong arrangements. The mounts they give you are all very strong strong and very capable. So having a backup to uh, grab the camera for you so you don't have an accident, that's another awesome idea for the cotton carrier system and why I highly recommend it. Now there are other brands available. It doesn't have to be this brand particularly. I'm just showing you a quality brand where I'm confident that these mounts are going to hold. I want you to think about this. If you're out and about and you've got expensive equipment on these mounts, big heavy cameras and gear, and then look, these can be worth ten dollars to $20,000 as kits when they're all together. Uh, could you imagine when they're going to drop? They're never going to drop where you're on your knees a foot off the ground on soft sand or soil, are they? If, if these brackets are going to break and they let go because there's a cheap, nasty Chinese knockoff or something, you know where it's going to break? While well, you're on a precipice where there's, you know, 100 metres rocks below you and you're sort of gingerly climbing around, that's when it's going to break and go to the ground and you'll lose everything. So you can't afford the risk of uh, anything chaotic happening to your very expensive gear. So when it comes to these sort of brackets and these sort of equipment, this is not where you save money. This is why you, where you find them, not the most expensive necessarily, but a high quality, well reputed brand to use because you can't afford to have bad stitching, bad attachments and crappy products dropping your cameras on you just because you wanted to save $50 on the day when you bought them. Spend the extra 50 or $100, know that it's gonna last you a lifetime and protect your gear forever. Now you may notice another little trick I used today and that is I woke up finally and I moved my microphone over to the side pocket. How many times have I had my microphone right in the middle here and I'm rattling and clanging and rattling and clanging, you can't hear a word I'm saying. So uh, I learned my lesson today so give me a thumbs up for that one. I'm sure it made the uh, audio a lot more pleasant for you. So thank you for being patient there and I hope that was a useful tip. So I hope you found that very useful, that cotton carrier uh, illustration there. It's one of my favourite little uh, pieces of equipment and accessories I've purchased over the last couple of years in that uh, it's, it definitely pays for itself and just makes the whole experience comfortable. And you just need a few little accessories as I've shown you here, the right sort of uh, pieces of equipment and you can have a brilliant time and really enjoy your experience. So in talking about enjoying your experience and knowing what you're doing here, Bit of advice I would like to give if I may, and I've got to be careful how I say this because it could come across like I'm being a bit, you know, arrogant or, you know, critical of people. This is not the intention. The intention is simply to be sincere and uh, give you whatever advice I can that's constructive and helpful for you, your long-term benefit. I talk a lot about lenses and cameras and lots of accessories and some of which can be quite costly. And uh, what I would like to encourage people to do is spend some time with a professional or definitely a pro amateur photographer who you admire. Someone you know who does very good work. If you're a portrait person, that's where you want to go and you want to get some equipment in that department, definitely go talk to and maybe hire the services of a professional photographer in that field who can spend a day with you and show you his equipment, how he does it, why he does it, and his recommendations. Because even if he happens to have a particular camera model, he may say, you know what, I regret buying this. I wish I actually bought a different model or a different brand. So I think it's actually very much worthwhile spending a couple of hundred dollars uh, hiring the services of someone for the day to take you out and show you the ropes rather than go and do some sort of an online course of photography you would get a diploma and you get a diploma in knowing everything you don't need to know or doesn't actually help you in the field. You really want some hands-on experience with someone. So if you're doing landscape photography, get a landscape photographer to show you around. If you're a portrait photographer, same portrait. And if you're doing birding and animals, go get someone who does wildlife to show you all the ropes. I encourage this because it's better to spend a few hundred dollars on the services of someone who knows what they're doing and has your best interests at heart than listening to a million YouTube videos from people who are maybe uh, not, I'm not going to say corrupt, that's the wrong word, but they're, shall we say, influenced via corporations who give them handouts, free samples, maybe fund them in some way given promotions, and so they've got a mental bias towards certain models, cameras, and uh, lenses and gear. 
So that's the last thing you want is someone telling you to go buy something just because they're being sponsored by a company and that, that helps them out. You want to help you out. So find someone who's completely independent, not funded by any particular corporation or organization who will give you time a day. I think that's a really good advice. So yes, there are YouTubers online that I watch that I know are Nikon uh, representatives. They're actually paid by Nikon to support their company. But I take their advice with a pinch of salt. It's very good advice as far as how to use the equipment and the application of the equipment. But when it comes to whether I really need to spend $25,000 on the latest lens or not, I'll leave that to my own discernment. Thank you very much. So I think because of their <clears throat> being influenced in a certain direction, the last thing you want is advice from people in that category. So advice in tech, yes, but advice in what to buy, maybe not. So uh, independence would be a great person and that's a great place to start. Now I always offer my advice for free and quite happy to help anybody out. Uh, if you're a local person in the Brisbane area, you wanna come out with me for a day or talk, that's fantastic, I'd love to have you around. You don't have to pay me, I'm more than happy just to be of service and help. And that's what I do these YouTubes for. Now that's a good point of relevance. I don't even have a paid channel. I don't get any kickbacks or benefits from any corporation or company, and I don't even get any viewer funds. What I get is simply just the satisfaction of trying to help people out and be sincerely interested in you guys getting the right gear and the right advice. So if I can be of service, please let me be so. But uh, certainly don't be overly influenced by what we would call cognitive dissidence. That is, Sometimes you get a bee in your bonnet, you get a little excited about a certain product or brand. You think, you know, if I had that latest uh, Sony A1 with their new you know, telephoto lens, my photography is going to be so much better and improved because you've heard so much hype about it. And though you go watch a whole lot of YouTube videos exactly from the Sony representatives, and it could be Sony, Canon, Nikon, Fuji, it doesn't matter. I'm using that as an illustration. But if they're a representative and they're pushing and promoting a certain product, they're telling you what you already wanted to hear. You wanted to be told that that camera and lens combination was great. You only watch videos that promote it and encourage it, and then you've convinced yourself to go out and do what you wanted to do anyway. That's a terrible way of getting advice on camera gear. So what I'm gonna ask you to do is to get as much mixed feedback as you can, go from different channel to different channel, try different people's opinion, look at neutral representatives, and then make a decision perhaps on that. So uh, that's just a little bit of a tip I wanted to put out there. But I thank you for hearing me out on that and I wish you all the best in your purchases in the future. See, I'm in a very fortunate position where uh, I know my gear quite well. I've been doing this for a long time and I'm quite skilled at purchasing, buying secondhand gear, whether it be on eBay or other sites. I can buy them cheap. I know what's worth buying. I know what doesn't work and I can afford to swap and change and buy again. And therefore I never lose out because no matter what I buy, I know I'm gonna be able to sell it and then get my money back. But not everybody has that skill set. So it's best to buy the right thing the first time. So get some good advice from people you trust and uh, that's about the best advice I can give you for the day. So thank you for your time and patience with me. I hope you had some fun and I look forward to seeing you in my next video in a couple of weeks. Thank you for your day.